keep aware of that temptation to slide into, I gotta make it look good, it's gotta be triple A, it's gotta be done now. Those three are killers. By the way, uh, Owen Yell is an expert in VR games and has several papers published. And we're bloody lucky to have him here today. Um, and he also has, uh, was one of the first students in my class about eight years ago and is now TA for the class and could not be happier with the legitimacy of game research because it deserves to be among the pantheon of media. We're trying to inject a bit of that into the talks. Um, so yeah, I didn't really expect to be back here today, but I'm back because there are a lot of stuff that we want to cover to make sure you're equipped for the uh, rest of the semester. So these are lectures are new, and they're mostly based on things that we have noticed that students struggle with, particularly coming up with innovation. And uh, you have just heard Professor Beasley gave a very good lecture. I am not as good as him, and I go very fast, so if you can, put down your laptops and phones, because we'll be blazing through a lot of stuff. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about game genres and innovations, and this is all the stuff we'd like to cover today. Mostly they're short, a few slides each, but uh, there are quite a bit of things we want to go through ideally, and that will help you. So first of all, game genre 101. What is a game genre? So, we have asked you in the first lecture to talk about your favorite genres. Let's see if there are any common elements between the different game genres. So, I collected them and made this chart and tried to kind of sort them if they make sense to be together, such as action, action adventure, adventure, adventure survival. So, you will notice that there's really no standard to describe a genre for you guys, right? They're described either by commonly used genre terms, FTS, or we talk about specific game, Rogue, Minecraft, Seven Days to Die, a particular mechanic, shooting, mastery, etc. Carol's perspective, uh, abstract concepts such as cure or horror, whether it's turn-based or real-time, game element, platformer, etc. So what is a genre? A genre is an informal classification of video game genres. So that's, or video game. And that is why none of you were wrong in the way you described it, because it really is just a label to describe something with a certain qualities. You either use it to show similarities between the game, oh, my game is like this worldwide, right? Or you want to differentiate, oh no, it's not a first person shooter, it's a third person shooter. But the uh, same time, oftentimes, genre is just a popularity contest. If a lot of people use it, people remember it, and they will stick with it. It is usually, at least in the terms of video games, not defined by the setting or story. So games are different in that it's interactive. So we can have a first person shooter, either a science fiction based, western, fantasy setting, zombies, and the like. But people are going to describe it with settings or stories anyway, just because it's informal. So they will say, oh, I'm making a World War II first person shooter, right? Formal classification, classification such as a taxonomy is really hard to do. You're trying to summarize a game with hours and hours of experience into a few words. So you typically want to say, oh, I have a police superstress cat is at home. You say I have a cat at home, right? And AAA games often include mini games and elements from different genres to change the pacing and to keep the game interesting. For us, indie games, they usually often subvert genre conventions to make it more interesting. So let's take a look at triple A games. Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, out of curiosity, who's playing? Okay, we got a couple. Uh, does most people know what Zelda look like? Show of hands. Most people? Yeah? Alright, so this is the Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Is it an action game? For those of you who play, do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but is it a puzzle game? Also, plus elements to it. Is it a racing game? Can be. Can be. Yeah. And is it a builder game? Yeah. Yeah. A new version definitely introduced something that's very interesting. Oh, um, back. And I'll just show this video really quickly for a few seconds. Oh, great ads. <laughs> This is 
a scenario where you're supposed to fight an entire army, and he built this flying drone looking thing that basically decimated the enemy in a very short amount of time. So now you're playing this game very, very differently. <laughs> and that's common in AAA, because they want to make sure you're not just bored doing the same thing, right? You're just playing action, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm so tired, I want to just you know, chill, then maybe you go stop a puzzle. And after you're stuck on a puzzle, maybe you go back to the monsters. So for a game like Zelda with 50 to 100 hours, usually the game experience will change. And even for online competitive games like Call of Duty, League of Legends, and whatnot, the core experience doesn't change much, but you might engage with it differently. You might go change your loadouts outside of the match, you might go look off strategy guides, you're playing it, just not directly playing it. And we'll look at an example from any game, Tunic. Um, we mentioned that often you use it to you know, subvert the genre. And it's also for a way to describe your game with something that's close so that people that are interested in that genre will play your game. And you also want to make leverage of the genre so you don't uh, you can avoid reinventing the wheel. So you can just tell someone, oh, use WSD. And they're like, oh yeah, I use WSD for other games. I can just do that. You don't have to teach them something new. In this particular particular game, you'll notice that it's kind of kind of interesting. On the bottom right, you see exploration, puzzle, so slush, cute, and difficult. How many of you actually played this game? Great, we'll talk about it. So, on the surface, it looks like a 2D Zelda game. The game starts off with graphics and gameplay very reminiscent of a 2D Zelda. When you get to about the second boss, you'll find this game is kind of hard. I can't just beat the boss in a few tries. I need to make sure I level up, get the right item, understand the game. And I, it requires timing and reflux that's much higher than the typical Zelda games. Then toward the end, you'll find to beat the game and to get a true ending, you actually have to solve a lot of puzzles. A lot. To the point I got really frustrated because that was not the kind of game I was looking for. And none of the descriptors talk about the one thing that is really unique in this particular game. To try to evoke the memories of you as a kid playing Zelda games, they have this in-game manual, the assets is in the game. And those weird fonts and all that, that never changed. They do not become English as the game play, uh, as you play through the game. They stay mysterious and foreign. But it is your job to figure out what they really mean and use that as a hint and a guide to beat the game. This is arguably the most innovative part of the game, but nothing at all genre mentions this. Anyway, so when you're applying your genres to your games or getting inspired by them, you need to make sure you have achieved a careful balance between not reinventing the wheel, but also that if it's subverting the genre, you need to make sure that the player understands. Otherwise, they won't have the same experience as me. I was really frustrated playing this game because it was not what I thought. I thought it was a Zelda, turned out to be a Soul Slide. I thought it was a Soul Slide, turns out to be a puzzle. And it is really hard to make sure you balance all three. And below are just some examples of genres or games that really defy the genre, and that's why they were really popular. Undertale is a big cult hit that a lot of people play and know. The Rico Village Club. No, I don't know if I should say anything about it, but it's not for everyone. Inscription looks like it's a roguelike deck builder, but it's actually more narrative based, and it's, it has a really interesting uh, card builder mechanics, but it is mostly really narratively innovative. So, creating genre, new genres, what do you need? Anyone can make a new genre. So, the problem is you need to be wary of your audience. If you say, oh, I'm making a roguelike, most people would know what it is. If you say, I'm making a vampire survivor line, I don't know if Professor Scott has played it. If you say hexagon line, based on adventure hexagon from last class, People outside of this class will have no clue what you're talking about, right? So you gotta be wary. So if you're talking to Scott saying, oh, I'm playing, I'm making this game that's fall fall light, make sure he knows what that game is. Otherwise, he wouldn't know. Right? I, I had to look up Doki Doki literature for so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Doki Doki like. Yes. <laughs> All right. But also, very importantly, keep in mind that popular usage can also corrupt the genre. That's an example. So we'll look at that through the lens of roguelike genre. Roguelike. How 
How many of you are familiar with robot games, for show of hands? All right, about half of the class. Can you name some examples? Mm, that that building game. Yeah. What, which one? Oh. Uh, or anyone uh, else? Slayers. Slayers Fire. Yes, Slayers Fire. That's the one. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 Which one? Dead cells. Dead cells. All right. We actually had a picture of that right before, right? Kind of hard to see it, especially with the projector. But you can see it on your computer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we have games like Splunky. We have games like The Binding of Isaac. We have a game like FTO, Faster Than Light, Hades, Slay the Slack. But the thing is, what are the common elements between these? <coughs> if we look at the camera perspective, you have side scrolling, top down, isometric, side view. Those are all very different. We have turn based games as well as real time games. So that's clearly not an important factor. You might have one character you control, or in the case of FTO, you have mobile phone in a spaceship. You might have twin stick shooting as your core mechanic, pack and slash in Hades, card slash deck builder, commanding units, and you have all kinds of things. So maybe these are some of the elements that tie together. That roguelike tend to have random environment generation. It features a permadeath. Once your character dies, you have to start all over again. You have exploration and discovery. And nowadays, many roguelike games have a legacy system. Once you die, you might have some resources you collected that will make your future run easy. <laughs> Guess what? Let's talk about the original rope. Anyone play the original rope outside of the professor? Maybe? Oh, you have one. That's why you're the grader. <laughs> this is rope from 1980. <laughs> and in case you can't make sense of that, the modern version will look something more like this. So it is really just ASCII graphics for presenting a dungeon. Right? And you're this character, a rogue, like a thief, going down the dungeon, finding monsters, and getting treasure. And so there are genre purists and roguelike traditionalists that will fight you for calling any of the game we just mentioned roguelike. So much that they have this thing called the Berlin Interpretation, drafted in 2008, that defines a number of criteria that make something roguelike and something that's not. So, these are the high value factors, and we see some of them in the examples that we showed earlier. Random environment generation, turn of death, resource management, exploration and discovery. But you can also notice a lot of things that we don't really care for. Turn-based, group-based, non-modal, etc. And then there's also the low value factor, which we definitely don't care for nowadays, ASCII display. How many games are we playing that's ASCII like low value? And so with the, that's this, this part is pretty much following Wikipedia, but it's saying that we have a lot of these games that people are calling it roguelike, and those people are really pissed. So they're trying to call it roguelike, or roguelike like. So, are you a roguelike traditionalist or inclusionist, where you would call Slayer Slide a roguelike game? Do you think roguelike will catch on? I tried to use it, but I feel like it doesn't really make sense that people don't understand it, so I'm starting to give up. But I definitely don't think roguelike like will catch on, which is too hard to say. But is it necessary to differentiate between roguelike and roguelike? What do you think? In some cases, uh, over at AGP, the Advanced Games Program, we still inherit uh, um, games from the students saying it is a roguelike and we've asked them what is rogue and they've never heard of it. And, and that's just generational. That's not dinging the students. I mean, I, I played that with fervor thinking graphics will never exceed these ASCII symbols. But uh, there is a three generations removed interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation so that I can, this is the natural conversation that happens when the uh, new generations inherit something and then make it their own. So it's, it's fascinating what you're saying. All right, we'll also briefly talk about genres and different cultures. Um, they have diff they use different terms to describe games due to local needs. That might be because they have some shared traditional cultural values. Maybe it was because of the games that were available historically at the time, it led to the need for that term. 
or that maybe those are the games that have been built by the local industry. So they build those games, and they have a lot of ways to differentiate them, because that's what they're good at. SLG genre. So in some Chinese-speaking culture, SLG refers to simulation games. But that includes both turn-based strategy or turn-based tactics. And the reason is that early days, they tend to be games about simulating war and battle. So to them, SLG means uh, either a uh, turn-based strategy or turn-based tactic. So we have some of the below, Fire Elbow, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and Civilization. We also have this thing called, the closest I can come up with is growth simulation. So in Japan, there's a genre known as Ikusei simulation game. And you can translate Ikusei as rearing, training, nurture, or cultivation. It is a simulation game that focuses on raising something and the process of growth. It's difficult to translate because what's what you're actually growing. So for example, you can race. Racing race horses with winning posts by Toy Tecmo, the people that bring you Dynasty Warriors. How many of you know about this game? <laughs> racing a girl or daughter with Princess Maker by Gangnix, who was responsible for their actually animation studio. They made Neo Genesis Evangelion, FLCL, Budenaga. They used to make this. Actually, I think they're still coming out with new ones. Why don't we have both? Racing a horse girl <laughs> with Uma Musume Pretty Derby by Sidings. <laughs> and what is really interesting about this game, and I'm not playing that video, is that after they win the race, they celebrate by being an idol group and dancing and singing on stage. So that is like the player's little reward that they can get to watch these girls sing and dance. And if your horse wins, they're in the center. All right, so these are all the different things that you might possibly raise. A uh, historical one would be the one on top left where you are high school students, you're raising your stats so you can chase the girl you really like. This girl might like a smart guy. This guy, this girl might like a really tough guy. So you raise your, you go to the library, you go to the gym. You have World War II ships, you have idols, you have sword guys, you have Tamagotchi, you have Pokemon, and you have Digimon. Japan, for whatever reason, really like racing games. I don't know why, but that is the thing. And that is why it is super difficult to find a direct translation, because they're just, they would just call this simulation games. They don't really differentiate them. So, if anyone has any other journals they want to share, now is a good time. Maybe the professor wants to share how <coughs> youngsters are not playing games like the way they should be. <laughs> I, as as a as a parent too, I really enjoy um, seeing my kids, eighteen and sixteen, um, talk in a language of sort of internet speak and video game culture. And Undertale was one of the first things that a lot that really kind of brought older brother and younger sister together. You know they were they were unequal for a while, and they found this common love, and now they just they, it's a re, it's a real connecting tool. So there's social games out there, and sort of cultures popping up around the love of games as well, which only exists in this digitally connected age. So this has such legs; it's it's actually spreading out more than just um, the games themselves. Yeah, I don't know much about. Indian culture, so I figured there might be some models here that you might want to share if you happen to can think of, but if not, we can move on. But I also want to briefly talk to the right. How many people know what a visual novel is? Yeah? So it is like um, basically kind of like reading a book, right? But sometimes you can make choices, and that's what makes it a game. Uh, one of the company decided that they will make this kinetic novel as a brand, which also kind of becomes genre by the virtue of it. So it is a visual novel where you don't have a choice. So you're reading a book. <laughs> but you get pictures and voice and sound and stuff, so that's kind of cool. But it's kind of funny how, you know, a book is now called a connected novel if it's on PC for them. High-level genres. So earlier we talked about how you group the games and genres into action, action, adventure, blah, blah, blah. We see that there's some kind of pattern that we can try to make a logical higher level grouping. So for example, we can try to do things based on like this. Action would contain platformer, shooter, fighter, beat them up, scale, blah, blah, blah. 
For your strategy, you have all these different ones. We'll talk more about strategy later. So what you can kind of do is sort, organize, and these gains based on a spectrum or an axis, based on either how much reflex it takes or how much thinking it takes. A gain either involves high reflex or it doesn't, right? Unless we're talking about something like Zelda, sometimes you need high reflex, sometimes you don't. But otherwise, it's, this game requires high reflex or it doesn't. So you can uh, classify it and group it that way. But it does not describe any of the other qualities that might make up a game. And if there are 100 games, there will be more than 100 ways to group them. But today we'll teach you one way, which is called multidimensional taxonomy. In short, an object can be classified by a series of quality of processes that we call out a dimension. Within the dimension, each object can be described by one particular value of that dimension, kind of like a numerator in CS. So let's say a more traditional taxonomy might be something like this. All ground vehicles are either motorcycles, cars, or trucks. And you're trying to explain to your little nephew that's like five years old what the difference between a motorcycle and a car is, and he tells him, oh yeah, motorcycle have two wheels. I have four, truck has six, easy. And then someone comes along and make a motorcycle with three wheels, a car with six, or a truck with two, and all of a sudden your taxonomy fails to classify. So instead we can consider a wheel as a dimension with a common value of two, four, six, like in numerators, and you can use that to help classify a vehicle to be, oh, it is a two-wheel vehicle, four-wheel, or six-wheel. But then, of course, when someone invents a hover vehicle or one of those spider cars or something like that with legs, then you have to change your taxonomy again. Nonetheless, it is useful to analyze games and game genres to create such taxonomy. It will allow you to have a better understanding of what makes up a game. And it also allows you to examine underexplored combinations, in which you can try to innovate. So, earlier, we mentioned all these different criteria of things that might uh, people use to describe their games and their genres. We can turn them into dimensions. So time can be either turn-based, real-time, timer-based, etc. Camera perspective could be first-person, second-person, third-person, <coughs> top-down, or side scroll. So if we were to make a really simple multi-dimensional taxonomy of game genre, we might have something like this. You describe it with the time dimension, followed by camera perspective, mechanic, and the strap concept. So Call of Duty would be something like a real-time first-person World War II shooter, which is a lot to say for something that people typically refer to as FPS. And you can kind of see why people don't typically do this. It's very worthy. The game Civilization might be defined as turn-based, top-down, historical strategy. Again, a lot to say for turn-based strategy. But what you can do is then you can mix and match the different values in each dimension to get rarely seen combinations, and that may or may not be worth further investigation. So how about real-time third-person mastery horror game? Scott, would you like to build that? Absolutely. Thank you. Or it can be a turn-based second-person deck builder racing game. <laughs> also, you can look out second-person shooter on the internet. It's kind of interesting. You're looking from the perspective of people you're shooting. <laughs> Uh, so for a proper multi-dimensional taxonomy, you should be able to use it to classify most, if not all, the games. And the one that we have is too simple for it, because we're not keeping track of player progression. If we were to add other elements that keep track of player progression, then we can classify things like Metromania, or roguelike, or Souls-like. Right? A lot of these define prior traditional taxonomy because those taxonomies do not talk about progression. So if your multi-dimensional taxonomy has a dimension for progression, you will be able to classify it. And so this is something that if you have interest, you can revisit after lecture, after uh, game week, and the word progression. And that would be the first part of the lecture. And this is a good time for a five, 10 minute bio break. Perfect, let's go for uh, eight minutes. That's immediate. So let's give them the time to come back. It's gonna be seven and 12. Yep. Seven and 12. Good idea to do your explorations now to find the, the restrooms. Yeah, I think it'd be a whole, I don't know. It's like today, but yeah, no, we thought. Yeah, it's 
the way that Tracy does it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's it's also applying to the CS stuff that we learned, so you know, doing the technology, trying to break it down, all that stuff. And that's why it's useful to help us. So we can almost call it like a more analytic approach to innovation. Which Sounds is not like in any existing book of health, is it? Which is not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I appreciate that you've the, the real time horror flavored match story as an example. <laughs> so are you putting three corpses together and then something happens? Summon a demon? <laughs> well, you have like person blocks and you have resource blocks. You want to sacrifice a certain amount of game blocks. Game jam time. That sacrifices the demon. Oh, this is the second person shooter? It is an example. It's a uh, driver San Francisco, and the uh, character, the player character, has the ability to jump into some other character. So they possess another person. <laughs> and they were trying to take that down like this big bad guy. And then one with the final mission, you were told to your like human thing. Let me just see what you say. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Into Ordell's body and, without arousing suspicion, drive Layla and Ordell directly into the police custody. Torgan Jones is driving their iconic orange Dodge Challenger, and soon enough you work in Ordell's body with Layla and passenger seat, which should give you some clarity on your mission. Ordell, I need nothing but your best today. It's going down. Jericho's not probably more than fixed. Getting the target and lost it. So you drive to the destination she's given you, closing up your target, and as you get close, this happens. Slow down. We should acquire the target anytime you want. We know a dodge. Up ahead. Stay close to the company of this. What? A cop is beginning an hour. Can you follow to the target? It's you. You've been assigned to kill you. So after that cutscene ends, you are back in the middle body in the first person with Layla sitting at your right. But then, if you press on throttle to accelerate, and the car in front of you moves. You steer to the left and to the right, the car in front of you moves to the left and then to the right. And then quickly it sinks in that the car you're controlling is actually the car you're following. Your perspective the player is second person and separate from what you're controlling. And it's nice so that like, you're like a long little discovery. And the story is the part you're sitting in. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 The part you're sitting in is moving automatically, seemingly operated by an AI controlled driver who's tailing the car you're actually controlling. Mm -hmm. For those of you that enjoyed the horse wheel thing, now we can. <laughs> so apparently, the music guy was told to write a very dead pot song. Dead pot is like. Electro waves, and in terms of Japanese, it means something that's very weird but strangely addictive. And he has never written songs like that. And he keeps trying and he keeps failing. And so one day, apparently, he says, Screw it, and just drink a bunch of alcohol, and he went to town. And this is the <laughs> other. Um, I don't know what to describe it that he came up with. Oh boy. Jack 
<coughs> kind of. Like after you win, your horse will be the center stage because. They're supposed to be like a separate species, so they have a year, but they also run faster, are stronger, all that stuff. So, question. Do they, do they walk on the ball with foot like a horse? I don't know. They also really like carrots. I think that's a stereotype as well. Horses <laughs> really like carrots. They don't have a good mental force representation. I like how the disbelief is suspended right up to the point of carrots. Second and third part of the genre talk about innovation Thursday, and have you do the Unity stuff first, or we can try to do it and see what happens. Your call. I think we should be able to finish. Okay. Yeah. If you don't feel like you and the uh, is this tethered to an assignment? Sorry, you done in class. Or it's something that can be done. It's still that they can do homework because it's basic to Unity. It's it's a lot of overlap with what they've already learned, but there are some important points in there that students should know, like how to host data pages. Let's stop at the half hour mark. Yep. Okay, guys. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll just say that we can finish it. That way, like, I know what person could have made to Thursday's talk. So, for Thursday's lecture, so we can get most of it done. Okay. Uh, uh, let's, show, let's go to the sprint system on the board. No, you don't have to All right, guys. We, do, we have a lot to cover. So, we'll continue with the game genre. Number one, breaking down genres. And what we'll do is we'll look at the brief history of strategy game genre and its so don't worry too much about the exact day of which game is first. That's what the historians worry about. Focus on what the examples illustrate. Oh, this is hard to read, but you have your slides and we won't really need this anyway. So it kind of shows you how the strategy game genre evolves over time. So you have like all the way back in 1981, turn-based strategy. Uh, you have real high strategy as early as 1981, but really, realistically, it got popularized around Doom 2, which is 1992. Mm -hmm. Then you have the real-time tactics genre around 1995. You have a tower defense boom of 2007, when it got popular again. Then you have MOBA, which is around 2008, when they went mainstream with League of Legends and others. And then more recently, you have the Battle Battler genre of uh, 2019. And these are some of the common features in strategy games, or maybe you can say SLG, military games. It has structures, resources, researches, terrain, units, and combat. By adding, subtracting, emphasizing, or combining the core feature, you can end up with different games, which may become a genre of their own. So, turn-based strategy are some of the earliest and most popular games as mentioned, chess, Go, Shang-Chi, board games, etc. With the aid of the computer, Turn-based strategy on physical media will turn into turn-based strategy game on digital media. With that comes increased complexity, scope, and graphics, because now you're going to have to do everything by hand. And here's uh, some of the early ones. Eastern from 1981, most people probably know it from Civilization 1981, and then you have other genres that define turn-based strategy. And again, with the aid of a computer, turn-based strategy can now be real time. The game shifts from having the patience and the skill and the foresight to make the theoretical best move to making the best move you can in the limited time you have been given. And again, real time strategy supposedly was coined to describe Doom 2 in the early 1990s. Recently, we have the Doom TV series slash movie thing with the whatever, and this is what the game looked like way back. So, this is kind of like a breakdown of real time history on um, the timeline. So, if we take a look at the common features of RTS, with the introduction of real time, nothing really changed because we're still doing the same thing. But with the limited time and attention to make decisions, people start talking about things like strategy versus tactics. Strategy involves high level decision making, and that is also commonly referred to RTS macro, macro scope. So, that is about unit creation, building structures, building culture, so to speak. Then there's a tactics, which is the lower level of decision making, which people call RTS Micro, Microsoft. 
It is about maneuvering through units or using unit abilities. And if we only focus on the low level position, that is the lesser known cousin of RTS, real time tactics. And here are some examples. But also, particularly, we want to talk about commanders behind enemy lines in 1998. So, if we look at those six core features or whatever, RTP does not deal with building structures or performing research. We only have terrain, unit, or combat. It is unit fighting while you're utilizing terrain, right? Using the cover, using the elevation, and so on. And a typical game involves uh, select fighting with pre selected units and from one side wings. There are always exceptions. There might be a reinforcement mechanic that allows you to bring units that were not present at the start of the combat. It is possible you can collect some resources, such as grenade, to improve your combat efficiency, or you might be able to gain experience and upgrade to a different tier. Kind of like um, having a veteran C system, and while chess is not a real time tactics, when your pawn go all the way to the end and upgrades, that's kind of a similar thing to what we talked about here. So again, what makes something RTS and something RTP? Because there are all these exceptions, I would say it is the focus of the RTP. RTP is more about controlling the visual units, and that determines what genre it belongs to. And thus, genres are useful in providing a quick overview, but because they're mostly binary and discrete, that makes something effective to deal with the minutes. There's actually a song you skip, which is about a RTS, they claim, where you play as a rat beating other animals, and your building units, your building structures, but you have to do that in a third person. So you have to move that mouse around to move your units to somewhere else. You have to go to where you want to build a building to build that building. It's called a human hell. From RTP, we also have this sub, sub genre emphasizing stealth, so like command. Commandos is probably the first example, followed by other games like Desperado. More recently, you have Shadow Tactics, the Blaze of Jogo, which is made by Studio Mimimi, and that in turn earned them the opportunity to make the modern version, which is Desperado 3. Typically, you control a handful of characters facing a much larger number of enemies. The characters will have unique abilities, enemies are typically very scripted to follow simple control patterns that you can take advantage of your weaknesses in enemy control. And one of the most identifiable features is perhaps this color vision call. You have this thing that is green that shows what the enemy is seeing. If they spot your character, it might turn yellow, and if they take longer and your character stays within yellow, it will turn red, in which case they call their friends. This also makes it a way to other genres, such as uh, Mark of the Ninja, which is a side scroll of stealth. So for this particular game, you have the same thing, training unit and combat, but you're emphasizing stealth, so it's not really so much combat, but more like conflict. <coughs> you'll be using stealth takedowns, and you're not typically directly fighting them. It is the emphasize or outright impossible. There are also some real-time strategy games without direct unit control. So you still have units, but you cannot move them around. Some example would be Settler, Dungeon Keeper, Majesty, and Stronghold. So, Majesty is one of the early examples. As a Majesty, the king of the land, you can choose what structure to build. But you can, you can also choose what units you might want, but you cannot order them to where you want them to be. So what you do instead is you put a little bounty flag on something. So you want to kill a bear, you put a bounty flag of 300 gold on top of them. If they want it bad enough, or if they think they get hit enough, they will go and follow the bear. And once they kill the bear, they will earn that money, and they will use that to buy equipment for themselves, potions, and whatnot. Tower defense. So for tower defense, of the six things, typically you don't have resources, and typically you don't have units. You say you have structures, resources, terrain, and combat. And tower defense actually go way back to 1990 with Grandpa, but as mentioned earlier, it is typically to the 2007 Hard defense boom, where people kind of notice it again, and it becomes like a stable genre. And you're going to say, wait, what about? Yes, there are always exceptions. There are tower defense with units, tower defense with units and multiple uh, multiplayer versus, so you're finding someone else, and tower defense with one tower and units but no capital. 
So Kingdom Rush, which is one of the most common drama nowadays, you have units. Your tower would split out a few soldiers that will stop the enemy death of their traps. Combat Crash. This particular game, you can build barracks, which will spawn certain type of units. And you're trying to defend your... The interesting thing, I think, is that the units actually don't fight each other. So your tower needs to take out their units, but at the same time, you want to have your production facility, so you have your soldiers that will take down their fort. So it's also a versus game. You also have power. It is a game where you only have one power. You build turrets, droids, aircrafts, and you fight to protect your one central base. And because of the fact you only have one power, all the enemy just converge towards you. You don't really have the opportunity to path it differently, so that take advantage of free shots. MOBA games. MOBA games go all the way back to 1998, Aeon Strike, Starcraft mod. But mostly we know it from either Defense of the Asians, which is a Warcraft 3 mod, and when Around 2008, 2009, League of Legends, and Am I God? It's not a name. What's MOBA stand for? MOBA is stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. You can change the size of this. Yeah, forgot about that. It is also something that is very interesting because at first, I think a lot of people resisted that term and they'd rather just call it the like, and nowadays we call it MOBA. And so, similar to RTD, you're mostly focused on terrain, unit, and combat. And you don't focus on units, you focus on one single unit. Of course, there's also the aspect of you playing with other players, so you're working together. And yeah, there are exceptions, there's probably a champion that can split into two or whatever, but you know how it is. More recently, 2019, we have the auto battler slash auto chess job. And again, you can trace this back to, I think, about maybe 2015 with Pokemon Defense, which is another Warcraft game mod. And it really came back to popularity with Dota Battle Chess, which is a Dota 2 mod. And you see now that um, the commercial AAA companies are very fast at copying it this time around. So you have 2019 Team Fight Tactics, 2020 Dota Underlords. And for Auto Battler, it's still the same thing. Maybe you have your unit in combat, but the, you do not get to move the units necessarily. They just kind of do their own thing. So you do it, and that's why they also put Auto Chess. There are other related strategy games, Warax, Artillery, City Builder, Colony Sims, Glass Sims, blah, blah, blah. So you can also think about how these are different in these other strategies. So I'm pretty sure City Builder didn't come from RTS. More likely someone just said, what if you were a mayor, right? But you can see that City Builder is very similar to RTS, with the exception that there is no combat, typically, right? So in summary, while there exists many games that I mean, there are many games that exist as an ancestor or precursor to a genre, oftentimes the genre don't really get codified or popularized until much later. You might be making the game that will start a whole new genre. And here are a look at some of the more recent genre that got invented, so to speak. You have the Soulfly from 2009 to 2011, Clicker slash Idol slash Elemental Games, which is from Cookie Clicker, or you can go to that earlier Idol Quest. You have Look Like Deck Builder, which is very specific. That is Lego Spy Punk 2017, Battle Royale. 2017, Extraction Shooter, technically that is not the same from Tarkov, and some people also describe it as a player versus player versus environment, PvPvE. And I honestly don't really know if Escape from Tarkov was an extraction shooter from way back, but nowadays it's getting more and more common. And of course, there's someone that made Darker Than Dark, which is an extraction shooter, but you don't shoot. That's in the fantasy game. You use swords and you use magic. So Maybe they'll invent another term to explain it, right? It wouldn't be extraction shooter, it's just an extraction action game. Auto Battler, Vampire Survivor like, and also you know, because I do virtual reality. Since the Renaissance of virtual reality games 2016, people have been putting all these games into VR, and that changes everything, right? You're not shooting with a mouse and keyboard, but you're actually shooting. So that has a different uh, feel and all that. So 
when we tell you to innovate, don't say something like, ah, oh, it's impossible, right? People are still figuring out new things to do. They're still new things being invented, and you could be one of them. Tell you room for innovation. And actually, if you notice, a lot of the genres we just looked at did not have to wait till then when they were invented to be invented, right? Way back in StarCraft, if you could mod, you could have made an auto battle, but nobody thought of doing that until later. Having seen all these different games and different genres, it helps you to peek a little further and a little more in depth in different areas, allowing you to innovate. So the most important part and why we spend so long talking about genre innovation, how can you innovate your game so that you would get an angle spots? The most common thing that a lot of you would do is just innovation by inspiration. So how many of you came into this spot thinking, I have this super awesome idea, I'm gonna build it? Anyone? One, all right. So he would be someone that is, has an inspiration, right? I don't know how you guys idea, but he has some idea. And that's what people typically do. It could be inspired by the game you play, a movie you watch, your life experiences, which Scott mentioned earlier, it's common. One of the big game designers, Miyamoto Shigeru from Nintendo, he says inspiration for his game comes from his cowboy experiences. Hiking up a mountain and seeing a big lake at the top of the mountain on Legend of Zelda. And when he was learning to swim, that inspired him for part of Super Mario 64. When he got a dog and was doing dog training, he built a Nintendo dog. When he was doing a gardening project at home, he made Pikmin. And his fascination with Batman still led to read it. This guy just like, oh, whatever is in his life, he's going to play the video games on that. Right? You can do the same. So we do recommend playing a lot of games, thinking and making a lot of games, but also in general just to live an interesting life. Expose yourself to a wide variety of people, activities, food, culture, so that you have a wealth of source to draw your inspiration from. But there is only half a semester to make your game. In a few weeks before locking down to a general idea, you need a more systematic approach, a more analytic approach to innovation. So we'll first talk about innovation by addition. Innovating by adding something else is also what we commonly see students do. So for example, what if we combine two genres that seem to be on the opposite end? RTS, thinking, FPS, shooting, action. If done well, you may end up with a blend of different genres that lead to innovative and fun gameplay. So this is some random example I pull up. It looks pretty cool, right? But at the same time, you may be doing twice the amount of work, if not many times more. You have to program this game system and game logic with both FPS and RTS. So you're making two games, right? Art asset, you need to make sure your art looks good, close up. But you also need to make sure you have a lot of art showing at the same time for the RTS player, right? Design-wise, you have to make sure the game is fun as RTS, you have to make sure the game is fun as an FPS, and you have to make sure when they interact with each other, each other, they're also fun, right? So if I want to play RTS and I call Aaron to shoot that guy and he doesn't, that is very frustrating for me as an RTS player. How do you design for that? And here is where I would like to apologize in advance. Typically, Scott would say, professor would say, uh, when you are making games, don't just do addition and just try to add a bunch of things, and he will refer to adding things to a burger. So for the rest of the lecture, I'll be using a lot of food analogies. <laughs> so apologize in advance. But more is not always better. Some examples, a burger tower. If you just add more food, is this a more appetizing burger? Anyone wants to eat this? If you get seven, you eat it in seven minutes, I think you get like a challenge, you might be free or something. This is about from Hawking's House of Burgers in Watts, about 10 miles from USC, so you can check it out. Next, donut burger. What if we swap a stable ingredient with something else? We add a lot of sweetness by adding a donut instead of a bun. This is um, Oh My Luther, Big Luther, from Oh My Burger in Cartina, where I live. It's also 10 miles away from USC. All the fun foods are about 10 miles away from USC. Burger with peanut butter sauce. 
This is actually a really common thing in Asia, I think, or at least in Taipei. Um, does this make the burger better, or is it a part of taste? I wasn't able to really find one specifically on peanut butter sauce, but I think there are a few PB and J burger. So if it's PB and J with meat, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Think about it. Yo, dog. I heard you like fries, so either fries or burger. So you can eat fries as the main while enjoying fries as a side. This is a Pittsburgh from Prismani Bros in Pittsburgh. Sorry, Pittsburgh. Also known as Prismani Bros style sandwich. But this also, like we mentioned about the different cultural genres and stuff, it serves a need. It is typically for historical either for the dock workers or for skilled workers. And so they work a lot physically. They need a lot of calories. And for convenience, they probably just want their burger and the fries together. So you know you eat two things at once. Anyone want to try it? Not really. So adding is not necessarily better, right? So let's talk about subtracting then. Innovation by subtracting. And this is also why we went through all those examples in the strategy example. By breaking down the features, then we can understand better how to remove things. So RTS is R RTP is RTS but without structure, resource, and research. Power defense is RTS but without research and units. We can sometimes innovate by removing a genre stable and designing around it. So we, were, we already went through our RTS example. Protein style burgers. We remove the buns and we just have more veggies. So the lettuce in this case serve us what the bun would have done to provide structural meat, right? Hold your burger together and keep your head clean. So anyone wants protein style? You might also like it better if you're like allergic to gluten, right? So it has a different meaning. But so our guests will talk about game kind of example. Game gen is like hackathon for video games. One of the game gen had a thing of platformer without jump. If you can't jump, how do you platform? Any thoughts? Fall. Fall? That's one way of doing it. Portal. Portal. Anyone else? Drop one gun. Drop one gun? Yeah. Anything? Inverse gravity. Inverse gravity? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look. So, this is actually supposed to be the first platformer. Well, most of the platformer nowadays we think of is based on Mario with jump. Space Panic, it had ladders, but not jumping. So the original platformer isn't even something you can do jumping with. But we can also think about why we need to jump. Um, we want to reach platforms, so location with different elevation. Can we do the same without performing a jump action? So we can also try to break it down, like we did with RTS, what makes up a platformer. First, a burger example. Common elements in a burger. You have a bun, you have lettuce, you have onion, tomato, condiment, cheese, burger patty. In terms of food groups, they serve different needs. Carbohydrate, fiber, fat, protein, and they bring different flavor. So they each bring their own thing. So when you break things down, that's the first step. You also need to understand what they do and what makes a good burger before you start subtracting and swapping things. So these might be some of the common game elements in a Platform. You have a character, player character, enemy character. You have some kind of item equipment. You have actions you can do: move, jump, charade, platforms, and other stuff. And rules and systems. So maybe a character can perform different action other than jumping to move around. Maybe they can make use of their item equipment. Maybe they can travel with the object that exists in the environment, or maybe they can change the rules of the system in the world. And these are some of the concepts that may involve movement or linking to spatial location. Gravity, magnetism, physically push and pull, or linking to spaces with transportation or space connectors, aka ladders, elevators, etc. So you can combine the two. B, 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 I don't even know if I say six Bs. It is a platformer where you get into gravity. So you don't jump, but you just constantly switch the gravity around. Grappling gun, someone mentioned that, right? So this is an item or equipment. You may also have other games where they have a teleport arrow, which can serve as a purpose of killing enemies or transporting to the empty space, fuel purpose. Maybe you use a high recoil weapon so that you fire on the ground and the recoil is so great it will push it through upward and forward and flare. And maybe you have a bomb, 
You drop it somewhere, it blows up, and it pushes you somewhere else. This is Professor's favorite game from the, I think, uh, 80s, 90s. I remember him playing in class. So this is a uh, burger time, and this is a game where you make use of ladders. You know, platforms, right? So you can use ladders, portals, portals, geyser, jump pad, catapult, or some alien, you know, abduction beam, whatever it works. Other examples, maybe we just alter the character itself. So in Snake Pass, you're a snake. Snake can jump, hopefully. There might be some that jump anyway. Um, you can use your low body to reach a higher platform, so long as if you have a firm grip. So once you make a circle around something, you can push its body up. Right? So this is a platformer, but you cannot jump. Uh, I think there are also some game jump games where instead of you jumping, the entire level jumps, which means everything gets shaved. I was able to find a picture of this, but you can kind of imagine you push a button, the entire level jump, and your enemy just jump it in you and fall down, and now you have to deal with it. So there are a lot of ways you can innovate if you, you know, subtract certain elements from the game. Innovation by emphasis. Sometimes it is worth deep diving into a certain aspect of your game. For a burger example, Smash Burger. This is a very thin patty. So what they do is they take the meat, they do something super hot, they push it down. And that creates a really thin patty, but it also has a really nice crisp, crisp exterior, as well as having a lot more mellow reaction. Some people really like this. If you haven't tried a Smash Burger, you can look it up. I think the Smash Burger is a chain as well, so you can go there, but probably find the non-chain one so that they have better reviews. The Steakhouse Burger, typically thicker and typically of uh, using meat of higher quality. So this is another way you can emphasize on the star of the show. Or for the vegetarian and vegans in the class, vegan burger, right? You don't necessarily need to do meat, you can do vegetables, and that serves a different meat. And you don't necessarily have to emphasize on patty, you can emphasize on the other ingredients. So in this case, a torta burger or a chapata burger, you're changing the buns. And that will create a different texture, a different feel. You can also do the same with vegetables or condiments, etc. So back to RTS. Given that a player at any given time has limited time and attention to make choices, of these six things, you cannot pay attention to all of them, right? So we can make emphasize the certain things while de-emphasizing the others. And but if you do too much of that, then it's basically subtraction. So you're not going to be utilizing. Um, for example, you could emphasize a unit, give it individualized equipment, skills, and other resources. So given that you're investing a lot of time in this particular unit or units, you probably don't have time to deal with the other stuff as much, right? You're busy swapping your equipment, giving it better gears and stuff. One example might be a hero-based RTS, such as Warcraft Cry 3, but it could also be a completely different implementation, as well as you're emphasizing the unit in some ways. Another example is, what if we just take the repair mechanic and emphasize the hell out of it? So, imagine a game where it costs a lot of resources to build new structure or new units. So to repair things becomes an emphasis. And also consider, let's see, innovation by subtraction where you cannot build new structures at all. So you have to make use of the existing structure only on the map. Alright, so one example. So you might want to place many neutral units in structure that were destroyed for the player to fix and apart. So this is focusing on emphasis and on structure. You can also add the mechanics where, for example, the repair object only recover a limited amount of its original max health. So maybe you have to do some research so you can recover one max health link into research. You can maybe utilize, uh, let's see, what is it? Oh, maybe some of the, of the neutral broken units are really good at certain terrain or have certain abilities that when you fix it, you want to really keep them alive because they're really good at that particular role. So linking them to train units and combat. Then finally, you might want to make a game where units are composed of different parts. Once you fix something, you can put a different engine in, put a different gun in, utilizing research, train units, and combat. So all these ways are things you can just focus on by looking at repair and see how they interact with all these different elements. Innovation by combination. Rice burger, combining a Western burger with Eastern rice dishes. 
you would place a wheat bread with rice, make it gluten free, which is maybe more palatable to local purposes while being exotic to Westerners. I don't know if you can find one here, but something more similar would be like a sushi, sushi burrito, right? I think that's made of rice and in the form that Westerners are more familiar with. The difference between innovation by combination and addiction. Addition, not addiction. Please tell me to fix that. <laughs> Combinations are more about taking some elements from one and some elements from the other. Not necessarily just saying, I want to do both, right? So obviously, the distinction is not that important. It's just understand how to do both. And one way you can do it is to add and apply the different game elements to different levels of the game. Rhythm games. Um, we found that historically students liked to make rhythm games, but they were having trouble innovating when we asked them. And I have a lot longer write up on this on why, but the important thing is at the end of the day, you see a red button coming or a red icon coming down and you push a red button. There's not much you can innovate on that. So, what we were suggesting that what they can do is to combine different products together using the idea of the inner loop and the outer loop. So one genre will be played either the inner loop while the other one will be played the outer loop. What does that mean? If we have the rhythm game as an inner loop and platformer as an outer loop, that means rhythm mechanic will be used to achieve platforming outer loop goals. In other words, you're trying to perform a single platform action using a single rhythm action. And we have an example of Mad Rap Dead. If you want to look at the non-platformer example, we have the Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Yes? Did you include um, a script runner in that or no? I forgot what that game is like, but I think it has a lot of rhythmic elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, but I haven't double checked. For what game is it? Fit Script Runner? It's a really good point. Yeah. The, yeah, with the little wake and the yeah. little eight bit love in it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is. Uh, Triple Necro Dancer, so it look, it's basically a double like, and that you have to do your actions on the beat, or it, the character might not work. So you want to move, and you push it on one beat, it doesn't move. And then you also want to attack things and all that on beat. Enemies also with moves on beat, so you might want to make sure you avoid their attacks because you know that in two beats it's going to do something. And because we mentioned the double like, they did end up making Cadence of Hyrule, which is Literally Zelda with the rhythm games. Same studio. Um, you can also have a single platformer action represented by multiple rhythm game actions. I don't have a platformer example, but here's Patapol. It's a side scroll action game. So to move to make those patapoles move forward, you have to hit the button pata 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 po. So you're doing four things just for them to move forward. What does a reverse look like? What if we have platformer as an inner and rhythm game as an outer? Um, so you're trying to perform a rhythm game action with one or multiple platform actions. I don't have an example commercially from that, so I made one up. Imagine Mega Man or Rock Man. When the yellow circle becomes so small that it's gonna disappear, you need to hit, hit that, right? And you do that with whatever platforming stuff you can do. Jump, slide, climb ladders, use different attacks. <coughs> Whatever you do, as long as you hit that yellow thing at the right tempo. And then right after that, you have to go hit that other guy with the blue thing at the right tempo. So these are like two ways you can kind of do combining the two different genres, by considering the inner and outer loop. And of course, you can always add more loops to your game, which goes back to what we were mentioning earlier with progression. So outside the inner and outer loop we just mentioned, you can add another one, which will be about progression, and yet another one about your meta progression, legacy system. And that's not super important. So that brings us to the in-class activity two, breaking down genres and innovating, learn by doing. So we have about 20 students, and you guys have each genre's of interest. As mentioned earlier, we can roughly divide them up to action games and thinking games. So I would like to split the class in half with half of them interested in making action games on one side of the class and the other half about strategy, puzzle, thinking games. Can we do that? Alright, so let's do that first. 
And then after that, we'll split you out into two to three groups with inside between three to five people. And then what you're going to do is you're going to try to do the same game we just showed you. Determine some representative games from the genre. Determine the core features to that genre. Brainstorm about how addition, subtraction, emphasis, and combination can be in other gameplay. And then you will write down the log lines for description and how they affect each categories in the shared team spreadsheet here. This is the spreadsheet we'll be using for this particular in class activity as well as the next one. And this is also where you'll be using to recruit your teams in the end of session one. Yes. Or two. Oh, and so here are some examples. Two to Survive. It is in the bullet heaven genre, or if you might know it as Vampire Survivor like. The twist is it's a vampire survivor with a claw. So we add a claw aspect, we emphasize the hell out of claw mechanics, and here's a description of it. So mostly it is two characters, but sometimes they need to be close to utilize their abilities, and they need to be far. Enemies might also attack them differently based on whether they're close or far. Guardian of the Forest. It is a strategy game where the twist is you have to chase away the human intruders in non lethal manners. So you might have a sanity meter and a stamina meter. You don't have lethal attacks. And the emphasis is on ways to non lethally take them down. So, a strategy game where you deter intruders with an emphasis on non lethal methods. You have to make use of the ever shifting forest and denizens of the aura to steer humans away. Waste your stamina by changing the path. Spook them away with creepy shadows. Confuse them with the great all know. Just don't kill them. Unless the humans simply cut and burn the forest on how long it gains. Okay? Does that kind of get what you're supposed to do for this in class activity? So these are these are games that don't exist. These are like Yeah, we made them up. Proposed games. Yeah. And we do also have some genre examples in the other tabs, so these are games that do exist. So if you want to take a look, you can. And also some of them are free or have them also you can try them out without them. Yes. What what's a bullet heaven? So you know how Vampire or do you know the Vampire is about me? Alright. So um, there is a genre of bullet hell where you're a character dodging a lot of bullets. Then you have something like Enter the Dungeon or Vampire Survivor where you're shooting a lot of bullets from the enemies. Uh, so some people Try to be clever and say it's a bullet heaven because I'm the one in heaven shooting and doing bullet hell on the other guys. There was a movie, there was a, a game in the 80s called Robotron that did that. You have two sticks, one was you move, the other one was the direction you shot. And it was just everything all at once. All right, so who's interested in action game? Can you raise your hand? All right, you guys go for the back order and whoever's on the thinking game, come over here. And it's fine if it's not the same size, but at least you want like a minimum size of three. You try to kill him. I got this question while you're making it. So, yeah. And you're not bounded by the results you're making. You're just brainstorming, so you don't necessarily need to group with your friends. Yeah, get outside your comfort zone. It'll help you. I thought, are we all done splitting? Are you guys action? Thinking? Thinking. You guys are action? A sphere with a slight concave. Uh, so the idea is also for you to just kind of let your thinking brain time a little so that you have a lot of ideas from your point of view. Is this thinking game? Yes. yes. How are you making it? Alright. So, is this the collection of thinking? Yeah. Uh, so you guys want to do what I call I tried to watch that movie because it was very really excited. Uh, so then maybe you guys can just uh, try to watch Why are you guys? 
Exercise. All right, then. Well, we can have one. Should we? Yeah. Can someone volunteer? Join? Who's going to leave the island? <laughs> by the way, we can't move yeah. over there, maybe. Yeah. Oh, we can. <laughs> but by the, yeah, if you want to be a brave soul, do it. By the way, when you get a job, you're going to immediately start working with people you've never met before. It's a great time to get outside your comfort zone. 